And next up we have Regina Keogh. Um, Regina is a pediatric and general registered nurse. She is an IBCLC and a Quidu breastfeeding counsellor tutor. Having trained 30 years ago in CHI Temple Street, she worked in pediatrics for most of her career to date in intensive care units in Great Ormond Street, Toronto Sick Kids and CHI Crumlin for 19 years as a neonatal nurse specialist. In Crumlin, she set up a breastfeeding champion programme and worked with a team to standardise breastfeeding support for families. She is currently the CNM2 Infant Feeding and Lactation Nurse at the Midlands Region Hospital in Mullingar, and she has a passion for supporting families to establish and maintain strong breastfeeding relationships. So welcome, Regina. We're looking forward to hearing your talk. Thanks, Gillian. Just get up my screen. Thanks a million. Um, so I'm excited to be here today and um, there's a lot of passion um, before me. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, supporting families providing breast milk in the paediatric setting. Um, just at the start of this, I want to acknowledge um, I've got lovely photographs from families. Um, some of the families, it's been quite a while since um, these photographs were taken. And while it was a trip down memory lane, it's a, a lane that some of them didn't want to go back down. Um, and some of the images are quite distressing. So I'd ask you not to share them, um, if that's OK. And I also want to give special thanks to all the IBCLCs, some of who are on the screen here with me today, that I've learned from over the past few years. Um, and uh, continue learning, obviously. Um, I know there's various um, levels of expertise here today, and I am, um, I'm just given, you know, some little tips is all. Um, I hope there'll be something here for everybody today, because I know there's lots of experience going ahead of me. So, but I want to do the families that share their stories justice, and uh, whatever I do time-wise, I need to get the stories over to you at the end. Um, so. Um, the objectives are to identify how to offer uh, practical advice and tools to support families providing breast milk for their sick or complex needs infants, to learn how to balance clinical workload while supporting these families to meet their feeding goals, and um, understand the importance of working within the multidisciplinary team to support these infants, um, and also to um, make sure that family-centred care is um, pivotal. Um, in the paediatric setting. So who do we meet in a paediatric setting? Um, as um, uh, Louise told us, you know, the paediatricians that she, you know, there's lots of people that we meet along the way. Um, so preterm infants and the, the um, age of viability is reducing all the time. Um, so these leaves infants with both acute in the early days and um, chronic feeding um, hurdles to be crossed. Um, infants with complex medical needs, um, congenital conditions of the newborn, neurodevelopmental disorders, um, metabolic disorders, malignancy, autoimmune conditions, and then you have the acute. Um, so the infant who might have been previously well um, at home with mum and is admitted with um, a sepsis, meningitis, respiratory illness, and we're heading into winter time now where there'll be lots of this, um, other acute infections or accidents or trauma. Um, also, you know, parents that have um, an older child that needs to be admitted to the paediatric ward, but they're still lactating for um, a newborn. Um, and indeed, colleagues returning to work. We have to be sensitive and support them as well. And, and it's great that the HSV have um, guidance on that now. So where does the challenge lie? Um, separation, that's one of the biggest things, and, and this follows very nicely from Lorraine's initial talk that the, the bottom picture there is just grabbed off the internet, but it's one where um, that's what we expect. When, we, when we're pregnant and having a newborn, we expect skin to skin and um, that to be in, un, un, interrupted for that first golden hour. Um, the top picture, unfortunately, is a little baby that we met um, when I was in Grumlin. And um, she had an antenatal diagnosis of uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And um, this is this family's first picture. And I'm so grateful for them to share it with me. And while it is distressing, they were so relieved that this, this baby was able to cry and they got her tube in and they knew that the next step was getting her to the children's hospital. Um, so, but that separation of difficulty of establishing lactation in that circumstances, um, we have to acknowledge that. 
the lack of information on how to establish lactation. That's for the, the, the family um, that's going to lactate and also for healthcare professionals. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And anybody that knows anything about um, lactation will tell you that when we want the oxytocin to flow and the milk to flow, stress and anxiety, lack of privacy and the, the practical issues that they come across with um, lack of equipment or space to pump um, can put, put challenges in their way. So for any of us that work in, um, in um, a, a neonatal environment, um, this is our bread and butter. We, we see this as, oh my God, look at all that technology. As a new parent, this is terrifying. There's a baby in the middle of all that technology. And um, this is, can you just imagine trying to establish lactation in this um, environment where you don't know the personnel looking after your most precious little person and um, we're asking them to put a machine on them and start making milk. So we know that skin to skin helps the baby and the mother with this extra uterine transition and stabilization phase. And it's just so important. And we would all love to have that um, breast crawl and that skin to skin and biological nurturing that um, Lorraine um, showed us earlier. And I think it's important for any of us working in pediatrics that you would always say that you may not get it, the breast crawl initially, but you can have skin to skin and as much of it as possible as soon as the baby is well enough for this. If the diagnosis was unexpected, um, the parents may be grieving the loss of the, the, the um, experience or the child that they had expected. So that makes lactation um, initiation much more difficult. We know now that there's much more um, focus on psychological distress and even long term on post traumatic stress disorder for these families and um, when they have an, and even for the siblings of an infant or child who's critically ill so so there we have one challenge another one and this is sorry what louise had had um, mentioned um, healthcare professionals knowledge so when i was in crumlin we were part of a, a quality improvement project where we looked at staff and um, knowledge and um, this is staff that were working in the acute setting with neonates and 36% of staff did not have formal education on breastfeeding despite it being available. And the same as in the UK, there's very little focus during um, for both medical and um, pediatric nurses um, on breastfeeding in their um, basic education. Um, 56% were using personal experiences to guide their care. So that can go one way or the other. If you've had a positive experience, that'll go well for the family or support. And if not, that can be um, the other way. Lindsay Hukwe, I don't know if you've heard of her. If not, look her up. She's a pediatric nurse based in the UK who, ha who ha is a well published. Um, and she did a similar um, online survey and she also found that 56% of healthcare professionals stated that lack of knowledge was the biggest barrier for them to support families. And 60% of them suggested that specific training for sick children is needed. And um, I loved participating in this when I was in um, Crumlin and Angela Ryan is the legend that is has and been educating pediatric uh, nurses, doctors, and allied healthcare professionals for years and continues to do so. So there is a course available in our children's hospitals. So please contact Angela for further information. And also there's an online course uh, called Breastfeeding the Brave that Lindsay Hukwe has as well worth um, if this whets your appetite to get a little bit more information. So why do we, why do we care? Why do these children? Obviously, it's the human right of every child to have access to breast milk. But for sick children, we know that it can reduce the length of hospitalization, reduce the severity of illnesses, they have less hospital acquired infections, and also reduces the incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis. So that's really important for both um, cardiac babies and also for uh, preterm babies. Um, so it's it's vital. It's like life saving. It's not. Um, a nice to have, it's a need to have. And um, for many people, they don't know what's in breast milk. And, and if any of you had been at the Alki conference at the weekend and uh, Dr. Jen um, talked about our breasts, our mammary glands, they initially were for immunological protection. And this blew my mind when I learned about this as a, a you know a young, a young mother, to be fair, because it wasn't until I had my own kids that I got really interested in breast milk and what was in it. 
um, and it blows my mind what it's it's a tailor-made every day if you have a 24 weeker your milk is going to be very different to that of a term baby it changes every day um, in your colostrum, there's secretory, IgA, IgM, and IgGs, macrophages, lactoferrin, lactoferrin lysozymes, ly lymphocytes. So it's live fluid and it prevents and stops infection in our infants. So we have it. Why would we not use it? Um, and then looking at the microbiome and for future health, there's stem cells in it and it's species specific. So we know, and um, any of you that have anything to do with um, the animal world would know that you wouldn't dream of giving um, a, a mammal somebody else's milk, but we do that all the time. And that has the effect on their long-term health. And that's what we're seeing. And that's what's a big burden on our health services. Um, we know that babies are expected to be born vaginally and that um, they're expect, they expect to have breast milk. And that canalizes our um, microbiome and gives us good um, future health. And any issues that happen after that are often to do with how we're um, born and how we're fed. So I'm just going to touch a little bit on uh, for my pediatric colleagues, who lots of you might know this already, but just the basics of how milk is made. Um, so when um, mothers are pregnant, they have high levels of progesterone that hold the breast milk production during pregnancy. Um, and when Louise was talking about antenatal harvest and colostrum that we touch in again, but, um, some colostrum will come, but not lots. Not until the baby is born and the placenta is delivered. We have a big drop in progesterone and a rise in our prolactin levels. And your colostrum will come, but it's very much about supply and demand. So thinking back to that mother who is maybe separated from her baby, and we're, taught, we're asking her to, um, to empty her breasts often, that can be a challenge. Um, and it, it needs the sucking stimulus or the pumping stimulus, but the sucking stimulus is obviously much more powerful than hands or pump. And this lady shared her picture with me. This She had a, a little baby. I'm not sure if you can see his, um, he's a little bit sweaty. His hair is a little bit damp. He's a little cardiac baby and she was working really hard to make milk for him and she was doing well, but he needed more calories and he wasn't gaining weight. So this is a really poignant picture where it, he just had his nasogastric tube put in and this is the first feed after that. So it's just to show how, um, you know, she's heartbroken, but he's latching on and that gaze between them, um, she's still feeding. Um, but you can imagine that technological environment that I showed you earlier on, if you don't know um, what to expect, how will milk start to flow? Um, we'd love it to be gushing out like this, but this doesn't often happen um, in that environment. And we have to do everything we can to help um, help that milk flow easily. So back to Louise's, uh, the antenatal milk expression. It is just so powerful. And uh, it, because of our advances in um, screening, we often know now um, of a, a antenatal diagnosis and these women um, are, are well versed before the baby comes. So I think if anybody that has access to mothers who may have a child that may end up in a NICU or a PICU, please have the conversation. I've listed loads of people. There's lots of people that have access to these mothers antenatally. Um, obviously they need to talk to the, their obstetrician as well, but from 36, 37 weeks gestation, gentle hand expressing a few times a day and having a little stash of colostrum can really um, pay off. So here we have one of my little ladies with her eye on the ball. So you know now why we should have um, these babies need colostrum. We're all about it. We want the colostrum. But the important thing is to know that there is a mother at the end of the boobs that are supplying the colostrum. And um, so if our priority is only nutrition and we want to get this liquid gold for the baby, how do you think the mother is in this equation? So if we're focusing just on milk. Mothers have described themselves, and I've heard this even lately, um, in mechanical terms. This is a vending machine full of breast milk. And this is how some mothers feel that they're just a milking machine or, or the, the NICU nurses or the PICU nurses just wanted my milk or they felt like their breasts weren't their own. So we have to be really, really careful with how we communicate with these mothers at this really vulnerable stage. 
um, our words influences their experiences. They mightn't remember what we say, but they'll remember how we make them feel. So we need to meet them where they're at today and let them know that the plans can change and that it's minute by minute and day by day and that we'll walk the path with them. And here we have a little fella climbing the steps. So we are the interpreters of all this knowledge. And from that vast vocabulary of all you know about lactation and helping mothers, you just need to use your words sparingly. We only want to help them onto the next step, a step at a time. So um, one mouth and two ears, use them that way and build the rapport with the family. And that way there'll be loads of milk and it will really help the baby. Diane Spatz is another person that, um, it's not the clearest there, but um, she is um, an IBCLC in the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and she's written extensively on breast milk um, for the pediatric and NICU baby. And she tells us that in the NICU, human milk should be viewed as a medical intervention, just as important as nutrition or a ventilator. And I really agree with that. Um, and while I'm saying that we're only giving them information to get them onto the next step, one of the important bits of information that we need to give them early on is that there's two target volumes. Sometimes, you know, the colostrum comes in small volumes. We know that it gradually increases. But we need to let them know that the, the breast needs to be programmed in the first two to three weeks to produce enough breast milk for the entire um, lactation. Um, so the support is really important and the hard work is really important to turn on all the milk making receptors in those first couple of weeks to, to really establish their lactation. Um, and donor milk is absolutely a part of the journey for some families. Um, and one of the stories I'll tell you in a minute, but um, for infants that are at high risk of necrotizing enterocolitis, we have donor breast milk that is kindly donated from other women and pasteurized and used for the sickest, most vulnerable babies. However, it's not like it goes through a lot of processes and while it helps with necrotizing colitis for babies to um, grow and thrive, they really need their mother's fresh milk. So um, it's there, but we need, we need um, to support them to make their own milk. So how soon do we start? And there's no, the research is varied on this. Parker et al has done a lot of research in this area and continues mostly with the very low birth weight um, infants. So we know that as soon as possible is the um, ideal. The same as skin to skin and a baby feeding within that first hour or hour and a half of life with expressing for a sick baby, similar. Um, but more recent research has said that between her newest research, three to six hours was associated with increased milk production at six weeks. So um, I think the important thing is to get in as soon as you can in a sensitive way and help the mother. Hand expressing is vital early on. If they've learned the skill antenatally, it really makes the journey so much easier. As pediatric healthcare professionals, we're not that comfortable with, with um, teaching hand expressing, um, but it's really important that we get comfortable with it. If we want the colostrum, we have to help the mums and hand expressing is great early on. There's loads of fantastic hand expressing videos and they're linked on the children's hospital websites. They're on mychild.ie. Um, the UNICEF one is lovely, um, Jane Morton, is the, her ones are lovely, so it's a matter of picking one that you like. Um, the Breastfeeding and Expressing Your Premature Baby booklet has been updated, and in that we have the QR code. So the QR codes there that I showed, they're in that, so it's really handy and easy for mothers. So in that early stages, when you just want to give a small amount of information, it's very easy to get the video up on the phone for the mum and let her watch that. Um, so if you're the, the nurse or midwife caring for the baby in NICU or PICU, pick up the phone, use who you have. You're not, the mother may be still in the maternity hospital. Talk to the partner. We know that support from partners is vital. Um, and, and talk to the midwives in the maternity hospital. We'd be more than happy to help the mother. I once talked to a partner who uh, he said, oh, now I'm not chatting her about that. You're on your own there, you know. But uh, this was a baby with a tracheosophageal fistula, a long gap, so it was going to be long hospitalisation. Um, the mother was so delighted to get the call. She'd started um, hand expressing and um, she, she went on for nine months to um, breastfeed that baby. So we just need to have the conversations and information and support is vital. 
Um, I'm sure you all know about Jane Morton and the hands-on pumping technique. If you don't look this video up, share it with all mothers, whether they have sick children or not sick children, if they need to pump for any reason, please um, look at this video. It has changed um, the, the um, amount of milk we get for, for babies and um, the fat composition. So it's great stuff. Choosing a pump, and this I know Nicola Byrne was the first person who taught me about this, and I'm very grateful, and uh, we continue to learn um, all the time. But it's a good quality multi-user pump is what we need for these mothers of sick babies. Um, they're not, um, if a baby is partially breastfeeding and is well enough for that, that's fine, and they can use any of the non-multi-user electric pumps. Um, but really, we need they need a good quality pump and access to that often and early. Um, the ones that are available to rent, um, they cost a couple of grand. So there's Medela Symphony, Ardo Caram, or Amida Elite. So we're lucky in Ireland that there's lots of options. It is expensive. Um, and I know in the action plan, people are working hard to try and get more support for families. Um, but it's vital that the mother leaves the maternity hospital with access to a good quality pump if she has a sick baby. Um, and I've listed some um, supports there for that. Um, another little bugbear, which, you know, you don't always know because when we order into hospitals, the flange size, that's the part that fits on the breast um, to help get the milk out. Um, there's various different sizes in them. We come with lots of different nipple shapes and sizes and um, we have our breasts, our sisters, not twins. So you might even have different nipple sizes on both sides. And that's really important because if we, if mother is uncomfortable expressing milk, um, she won't get milk and she and the baby won't get the food that they need. So this is just a little acronym. It's comfy. That is the name of the game, a bit like when you're breastfeeding your baby and somebody asks to check the latch. It's all about how comfortable does it feel. The same with this, when they're pumping, it needs to be comfortable, it shouldn't hurt. So the nipple needs to be centered, only little or no areola in the tunnel. The motion should be gentle, it should feel comfortable and you should end up with a well-drained breast. And here we see too little, too big and just right in the middle. Um, and it is important to sit, spend the time, if you can, with the mother in the first time she pumps. After that, it'll, she'll fly it. Um, so on to the practical tips. And um, am I doing okay for time? Yeah. Um, okay. So um, I'm just going to fly through these because I want to get to the stories. So um, practical tips. There's so many. And you can spend a day talking about this. I could spend a week. Um, the important things are discussing daily what's happened with the mum. So back to the communication. It's really important that we chat to them, see what's going on. The day they leave the hospital without their newborn, that's a devastating day. We, they need support. Pump might not go that well that day. But let them know that. Acknowledge that. Um, the standardised assessment tools are really helpful. And even if they're three weeks or six weeks expressing, it's still important to check in with them. So this is based on UNICEF and um, you'll find um, an adaptation of it on the, the Brumlin website, but it is worth, so it's expressing assessment tool. Have a look at that. Um, and I, I think it, it does, um, we need to have the same information and check in with mothers all the time. Uh, flexibility, this thing of three hourly, they, we don't eat at three early intervals generally. Babies generally don't. Pumping can be more flexible than that. The number of times in 24 hours is what's important. So eight to 10 times initially pumps in 24 hours is what's important. And once all the prolactin receptors are, are turned on, once they have full milk supply, which is in or around a liter a day, a little bit less, a little bit more. Some women in this situation, if they hyperlactate a little bit and then they have more um, room to reduce supply um, when, you know, when on days that they can't have the capacity to pump so often. It's very much dependent on their storage capacity. Some people can reduce the pumps. I know women who could do lots less pumps and, and get lots of milk. Um, they need to record their volumes. And in the new updated booklet, um, there is a little diary to start and a very realistic one. 
um, the pump in both breasts at the same time, um, the hands-free um, pumping, um, ha getting help with sterilizing. So talking about who can help in the family, who's going to, th this is a lot of work. Are there siblings? How will that work? If there's a toddler, maybe give a set for the toddler to um, pretend they well, mom is pumping. Um, a cool pack maybe in the cooler bag at night time that mum doesn't have to get up and, and bring the milk to the bed. Partner can either do that for her or, or leave the milk and bring it down to the fridge in the next morning. Take any offers of help, any practical offers of help that you come. I had a friend who had a baby with a cleft a palate and she pumped for a long, long time. And her friends came in in the morning and they just washed and sterilized and her sterilized her pumping equipment. And that was a huge help and support to her. Um, check your health insurance. There may be some postpartum doula cover and lots of people haven't heard of that, but it is available or take any help that can be gone. Um, if, so there's just a few tips. If an infant is admitted to a pediatric ward, an older child, you, they don't have to do that intense pumping. Um, they can pump as often as that the child was um, breastfeeding at home. Um, however, if the child was unwell with a respiratory illness, say for a couple of days before they've been admitted to hospital, sometimes that can have an effect on the milk supply. So that baby that you saw in the very first um, picture, the first little Anna, her first picture, that, mo that baby was readmitted um, to the pediatric ward, not to the ICU with respiratory um, syncytial virus at about eight months old. Her supply had completely tanked. And mum was really worried that um, she wasn't going to get her milk supply back. So just lots of positivity. I didn't know whether she'd get it back, but just lots of positivity saying, you will, absolutely. And lots of pumping, and she did. Over the weekend, her supply came back up and her little lady went back in the breast and ended up not needing to go to ICU, having um, um, a diaphragmatic hernia. That's not too bad. Um, we need to look at facilities for these mothers. Staying with the infant 24 seven, provision of food, um, and, and things like that, the practical things. Okay, I'd love to have more time to talk about latch and attachment. Um, one of the best resources for latching and attachment is global health media videos. So we'll have a look at them. Um, this is little Una, this is day one. She has trisomy 21. She's latched on there. You can see she needed a little trickle of oxygen, but she's doing great. Um, but in paediatrics, we need to think, you need to think outside the box. It's not as straightforward as having um, an infant who just latch on. Um, you know, this, this child here with an exemplus, um, that will need the multidisciplinary team. You might hop in there as the um, breastfeeding champion or as the um, lactation consultant to support with positioning attachment. Um, you might need the occupational therapist to help with a support for the um, abdominal defect. So there's lots of things that can be done. This baby can absolutely breastfeed, um, but support is needed of the whole team. Um, a little baby in a pelvic harness, again, maybe um, the koala bear hold will work for them, but we just need to think outside the box. And this little baby, um, the, the, with the tube, um, that baby was feeding but needed extra calories, so there was an at-the-breast supplementary needed. So there's so many, it's a, such a specialist area, so there's so many things that, um, um, scenarios that you're going to come up across, but I think get the education um, and, and you know that there's support and where there's milk, babies will transition to the breast. Um, it might take time, but they absolutely deserve the support. And there can be challenges along the way. And sometimes if you start your mothering journey in, a, in an environment where everything is measured and, and um, you're on a monitor and people are obsessed with every calorie and every drop that goes into the child, it's very difficult to turn your brain from that to, oh, just go by the baby cues. Um, you know, the baby will tell you when they want food. Um, it's very difficult to go to that. So they need an awful lot of support. They'll often leave hospital doing some bottle feeding. Not that breastfeeding is less physiologically um, taxing on an infant than, formula, or than bottle feeding, sorry. Bottle feeding their express breast milk. Um, but often the quickest way to get the baby home is to give breast milk in a bottle and then to work on that in the community. But it's, it's to support the mother to get there. 
um, and to give them realistic expectations for their infants, to look at where they're, they're coming from. Um, looking at um, skin to skin, getting back, regaining that um, the, the, the very start that they may not have had, um, the biological nurturing position, um, protecting the milk supply while they're doing it, which can be hugely busy, and to work with the whole team, not just um, the IBCLC, I don't mean just, but you know, um, the medical team, the dietitian, and the speech and language therapist. So that leads me on to the stories. So this is Lawrence and um, just, Regina, we just have a few minutes left, Regina. So just to let you know, just maybe three okay. minutes, would that be okay? okay. Yeah. Three. Bye, okay. Regina. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is Lauren. I she is a 38 week or a severe intrauterine growth retardation, born less than two kilos. She had a coarctation of her aorta and a VSD. And normally the cohort would be fixed very soon after birth. However, um, this the, the, uh, she was so small, she had to stay in hospital until she increased weight. Her mum found it very stressful express, expressing in the hospital environment. She needed some um, donor milk initially. Um, she had some suckling at the breast um, pre-op, but she had uh, not too much nutritive feeding at the breast. Um, but her cardiac surgery went well. However, she had vocal cord palsy post-op and she wasn't uh, sucking. She, she could do some um, breast feeding from a bottle if she was up for sucking, but she wasn't. So she was discharged home on nasogastric feeds via pump. Now this mother was busy juggling, maintaining her milk supply, feeding and caring for a toddler. So when she contacted the lactation consultant to look for support with breastfeeding, she was a little bit disappointed that the, the, she had to work on suck exercises first and to keep her milk supply up. Four weeks later, sucking skills had improved, um, lots of skin to skin at home, lots of um, gentleness. And um, then she got an IBCLC assessment of feeding and she just performed like a little champ and the, she had a lot of support. It wasn't easy. There was a public health nurse was very involved with weekly weights and sometimes twice weekly weights when she was pulling the NG tube and getting her onto fully orally feeds. But there she is sticking out her tongue, happy out. Um, this is little Sean and Sean was a term baby, fourth baby to a mum who was also a midwife and her fourth section. So she was very, she knew she was going to breastfeed her baby, but she was um, concerned about getting milk to him quickly. She was delighted when he latched on initially. However, it was apparent very quickly that this was a sick little man um, transferred to special care and onto the children's hospital later that day. And she'd separation and trying to pump in a, a referral hospital. Um, Sean went to the breast as soon as they were reunited though, but on day 10 he was diagnosed with, I'm not even going to try and say it, but he had a cancer that affected his liver, spleen, skin, and he was commenced on chemotherapy. Sean breastfed as much as he could and he got extra milk via his feeding tube. She said sometimes he had no energy to feed, although he always tried his best. And the dietitian and the um, cancer ward was so supportive, but facilities were not supportive at that stage. Treatment lasted two years and 10 months, and he had numerous hospital admissions, seven types of chemo, two anaphylactic reactions, pneumonia, and other infections. But Sean breastfed exclusively, and he finished feeding at three months or three years old. And there he is at community games now. And his mommy said, as a mother of a critically ill baby, breastfeeding became the most important part of caring for him. I sat feeding and cuddling him for hours on end. And I remember thinking every feed I was passing on strength to him. And he never refused to feed, which really gave me comfort. And Gillian, have one final one that only came to me last night. And this little woman oh, is, I think uh, everyone's enjoying it. So yeah. Go okay. <laughs> I have to share her because we're really here. Haley was 33 uh, plus three weeks. She's a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And her mom said the first day she, she came to um, the children's hospital, they showed her to the pumping room. And she said that made me feel, now they would express me at the bedside, which is the idea as well. And, and, um, but that made her feel like she had a role in the care, even though um, she couldn't care for her little one as most new moms. She felt completely helpless in saving her daughter's life, but the, the staff made me feel that my breast milk would make a difference to her and that encouragement kept her going. Um, at first she dishes with her supply, the funnels were too small and she tells us about it causing intense pain, but you can see from the little freezer stash there how well she did once we sorted that. 
So 11 weeks in PICU, she said every day um, the nurses gave her help and support she needed. She said, it was an extraordinary circumstance I found, found myself in. None of her friends or family could support her, but the staff did. And without them, she wouldn't have pumped for six months, which ended up supplying Haley with almost eight months of express breast milk and one of her proudest achievements. And there's Miss Haley now. So, let's see, I had to tell you them. Um, why do we breastfeed sick children? For their immune support, it's personalized medicine, a sense of purpose and involvement for the families, a sense of maintaining normality um, and to provide comfort and connection. And finally, it's nutrition. So us with the eye in the ball and thinking about nutrition, it's not that at all, it's part of it, but it's their immunity. So we can all work together to support the breastfeeding relationship every step of the journey. Thanks very much. Thank you, Regina. Um, again, everybody's really appreciating your, your knowledge and uh, your fabulous presentation. So thanks, Regina. I think it's really nice to get a slant from a pediatric point of view as well, because it's such an important aspect of um, supporting breastfeeding. Um, you know, in a different environment, we talk a lot about the maternity hospital as a community, but I think we need to think a lot about the pediatric session as well. So thank you very much, Regina. And I'm just going to go to one question, if that's OK. Just, um, just uh, because of time. But um, one question was asking, how can we get the NICU or the PICU working together with the maternity hospitals to develop a pathway to organise, um, I suppose, more resources in relation to an Irish milk bank um, more available in Southern Ireland? Do you have any idea? Is there any work going on in that space or um, are you familiar with any? Yeah. Yeah, I, I know there has been talk of it and I know it is, um, a, you know, it's, it's really important. Um, I think one of the Margaret's down in Margaret Leary is it down in Limerick and um, that was a little um, project for her. So I'm not sure how um, that um, went on and maybe Laura be able to, to tell us something about that. Um, and I, I suppose while absolutely I think a donor milk bank and to um, keep them going in the early days and to, you know, like that mother needed the little bridge until her own milk was established. But I really want people to really focus on mother's own milk. Um, so um, I, I think Laura might have something to say on the donor milk bank. I'm sorry, I don't have any more than that. That's fine, yeah. Regina. No, thanks. Um, and thank you again. And I think just everyone's saying how amazing your presentation has been. So thank you very much, Regina.